Let's just uh, read together a portion of our reference scripture this morning. It's coming from the book of uh, uh, Malachi chapter 3. Malachi chapter 3 from verse 11 to verse 12. And I have decided not to read verse 10 because verse 10 is not very exciting. I think it has been abused, isn't it? But somehow, verse 10 will find it its way inside my sermon. Okay? So don't worry about it. But let's just look at chapter 2. I mean chapter 3, verse 10 and verse 11. Last Sunday, I was in Mombasa Road together with my wife Nelly. Our church at Mombasa Road, it was such a beautiful and a wonderful moment of praise and worship and giving, delivering God's word. They did ask me to bring their greetings. Do you receive them? We had a powerful time there. And we thank God for what God is doing in Mombasa Road. So we want to read that portion of scripture. You have your Bible? Can I see it? Let me see the Bible before you read it. Just put your, your hand there. Let's confess. This is my Bible. And do it as though you believe it. This is my Bible. This is the word of God. Do you believe it? You can say, I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I can do what it says I can do. You believe it? Say this morning, I'm about to receive this ever-living, infallible word of the living God. My spirit is alert. My heart is ready. Confess I will never be the same again. And if you believe it, say amen. Okay, let's read. That is uh, uh, Malachi 3, verse 11 to verse 12. And this is what the Bible says. It says, and I will rebuke the devourer for your sake. For your sakes. I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes. And uh, I would ask you when you sit down to underline the word your sake. That's very key, very important there. I don't want you to underline devourer because that's not a good word to underline. But bear at the back of your mind, he will be rebuked for your sake. And he shall not destroy the fruit of your ground. Neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, says the Lord of hosts. Then the Bible says, and all nations will call you blessed. And ye shall be a delightsome land, says the Lord of hosts. Our Father, we thank you this morning. You've been so good. You've been so gracious to us. The whole week, Lord, you've been good. And this morning, your people have come into your house to worship you, dear Father. And indeed, in our praises, I believe and I know you have ministered to us. And we have now this moment when we are before you for a few minutes just to hear what the Spirit has to say to the church. I pray that, Lord, you will bless each and every person that is here. And even those who are visiting us for the first time, I pray for them that, Lord, they will not be disappointed for being in this house this morning. And so may you speak to us through your word. Bless the giver and bless the receiver. In Jesus' name, we pray and believe and together we say, Amen. And be seated in the presence of God. Now, you may be wondering, why is Bishop picking the word in the book of Malachi, chapter 3 and verse 11 and 12? I have picked this word to advance on what we were sharing the other Sunday when I was here a little bit on the life of Jacob and also to minister to us to show us what the favor of God can do if a believer allows God to do that in his life. And uh, if you may wish, I'm calling this message, When the Lord Rebukes the Devourer. When the Lord Rebukes the Devourer. That's what I'm calling this sermon. And I picked it because I remember when we ended last Sunday, the other Sunday, we ended at, at the place where Jacob has made room for the Lord to bless him. We were learning that when you make a vow and you give a vow to God, you make God your debtor. And what God will always do is that God will always fulfill his part, the part of that bargain. And how will God do it? He'll make sure he blesses you so that you too can fulfill your vow. That's where we ended the other Sunday. And here we are looking now at what no normally happens when the Lord gives us the privilege and the opportunity for us to be able to do so. So Jacob is an example that I'll be, I'll be using. But before I go there, I have picked this portion of scripture because I have come to understand that this was the Lord speaking to Jacob, whom the Bible calls Israel, the father of Israel. And that we shall see again 
when we shall go into the details of the story of Jacob at some point later, when God changed his name from Jacob to Israel. So it's the same God who is addressing Israel here and is telling them, I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes. I will rebuke the devourer for your sake. And he shall not destroy the fruit of your ground. He was simply speaking to his people concerning a situation that God was going to deal with in the life of his people. Now, I want also to establish one thing. That when God blesses you, those blessings come because of his favor. That's what we've been learning over the period of time. God never blesses us without him, him favoring us or without his favor being upon us. Jacob is one man in scripture that we all know was a, a darling of God. The Bible says, I have loved Jacob, I have hated Esau. To signify to us that he, it was the favor of God that made this man to become what he actually was. And in the life of Jacob, we are seeing him when he's leaving his brother. I mean, his, uh, his uncle uh, Laban. And the man is living when he's fully loaded of many, many goods which God had given to him. To signify to me that God will never let you go without his blessings. And the favor of God always carries with it his blessings. God will never give you favor without giving you his blessings. Now, these blessings were not earned or they were not merited. They were simply granted. Actually, what we want to learn here this, I mean, this morning is that whatever God has given to you, it's not because really you've worked for it. Because the problem that many of us have in our lives is that we come to a place where we begin to imagine that what I have or what I possess or what I have acquired in life, I have done it through my own power. Now Jacob is leaving his brother's place and the Bible tells me he's now loaded with so much that he had that even his brother's son, I mean his, uh, his uh, uncle's sons are now envying him. To signify to me, God had abundantly blessed this man. And uh, he had not done it or he had not gotten these blessings because of what he was. He had gotten these blessings because of what God simply was. And God having given you that blessings through his favor, one of the things which I've been learning of late is that he will always protect what he has given to you. He will never give you anything and allow the enemy to take those things away from you. I don't know if you've ever wondered... Many times we look at people, today you find a person is so much blessed. You look at somebody, you see this person has literally everything that you may be looking for in life. But after a short while, you realize that person has lost everything that he had. Let me just give an example here. Have you ever wondered, someone who was very, very, very rich, seemed to be doing very, very well, maybe successful in life, and then suddenly at no point, you realize this man has lost everything that he had, and he has become just an ordinary person. And this is very true for some of us who can reflect back from where we've come from. I was saying in the first service, just close your mind for a while and take it back to your home or to your village where you come from or from the community where you live. And you realize there were certain people in that community whom you really admired at some point. Or maybe when you looked at them, you would wish in your spirit that I wish I was this kind of a person. And then suddenly, you find this man has lost everything that he had. I want you again to imagine somebody who has put a lot of effort in something. You've been believing God and trusting God, you know? Put a lot of effort in something. You Probably you put in all your money in a business venture or you're putting all your money in a project that you want to do and suddenly you discover the project is ending without you making any money out of it or you've just, you just have very little or no success at all in that. Or sometimes you begin to imagine somebody who has been trying so very hard to begin some kind of a business or some kind of a venture which he wants to venture into. And this person never takes off. I discovered there's a spirit behind that. Or there is something behind that type, I mean, that type of a scenario which I'm calling here the devourer. The devourer. This is what God was addressing in the life of Israel. When he, he spoke in Malachi chapter 3 and verse 11. Where he spoke and he told Israel... I will rebuke the devourer for your sake. I will rebuke the devourer for your sake. And I kept asking myself, what did he mean when he was telling Jacob here, using the word the devourer? I went into the scriptures to find out what, does the, what is the meaning of the word devourer. In fact, in this sermon, if there is anything you can pick, just pick the word devourer and for your sake. And then we shall cloth it up with what we are supposed to do. I realize Jesus mentioned in the book of John, chapter 10 and verse 10, he said, The thief cometh not, but to steal, 
to kill and to destroy. But I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. It means each one of us who is endowed with the blessings of God, all those blessings that we carry on ourselves, there is somebody somewhere or there is something somewhere that is not happy with the blessings that you have. And I can tell you this, from the Garden of Eden when God made Adam and placed Adam in that garden, there was the serpent, there was Satan himself, who was not happy with the favor that God had given to Adam. And he had to send somebody to devour those blessings that Adam had. There are moments when we begin to imagine to ourselves that these things that we have in life are with us to stay. But that's not true. This is why Jesus made it very clear. He comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. So I wanted to find out what is this that he was speaking when he, he said, I will rebuke the devourer. And I realized the meaning of the word devourer, if we can go a little bit into the meaning of it, is simply a destroyer. A devourer is anything that destroys or causes loss or ruin. Imagine in your life things that come to cause loss or to cause ruin in your life. Today you are healthy, tomorrow you are not healthy. Today your business is doing very well, tomorrow your business is not doing very well. Today things seem to be working for you. You've just come from college and uh, things begin, uh, they're looking very bright before you and suddenly something happens in your life that robs you of that future that you are believing God and trusting God for. That is nothing but the spirit of a devourer. That's the reason why when we look at that definition of this devourer, the Bible calls him a destroyer. The true dictionary meaning, if I went a little bit further, is simply to eat up greedily or ravenously. Something that just comes and eats up what you have, ravenously. A destroyer, a sponge. These are dictionary meanings. A sponge, I was reminded when I was a small boy, my mother used to wash us with a sponge. I don't know if mothers do the same up to today. And uh, she, would make, she would buy a very big sponge. Yeah? So whenever I'm put in the basin, what I would do, I can remember. I would put that sponge in the water and it would ravage the water. And then I would squeeze it back in the bucket. You know? Now when we talk about a, 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 a devourer, we are talking about a sponge, something which actually devours, takes away very quickly, really takes very quickly what you have. It's like leech, a leech. You hear we are going to leech him. It means they're going to destroy you speedily and finish you, Maramoja. A user, a predator, an exploiter, a sponger again here. And finally, they call, it a, a, they call him a what? A vulture. Uh, vultures, you know what vultures are? These birds that never, they, nev they, never, they never saw what they reap. A vulture will always wait until you have something and the vulture will come for it. It waits until the prey is, is, is ready. And the vulture comes and, 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 takes that, and, and he takes that prey. To, make, to signify to me that the true meaning of the word devour is simply to destroy. Now God was telling Israel, I will rebuke the destroyer. And I can tell you here as the children of God today, God will not allow what Christ has given to you to be taken away by the devourer. They will, God will always come and rebuke the devourer on your behalf. So he says the, the word is a destroyer. A devourer, therefore, is a destroyer, like I've said here. Someone or something that comes to destroy what you have already acquired. Now, the devourer manifests himself in many forms. And I, gave an, I spoke about this in the beginning of this sermon. A devourer manifests himself in things that I want to mention here. Number one, things like diseases. Magonjwa. You have made money over the year. And just towards the end of the year, a disease attacks you. And you find everything that you have made in life. The monies that you have actually been keeping in your bank. I have known men who had actually even houses and homes. They end up selling their homes and selling their property. Simply take care of some of the diseases that come upon, and come upon us. A devourer is in the form of a disease. A devourer can be a sickness. The small, small homers and the small, small uh, flus and men, that some of us go through. That the little money that you have made, you end up paying to the hospitals and paying the doctors. And you realize what you had actually acquired, what you had actually made in life has been taken away from you. A devourer can be something like uh, financial or business losses. You do your business and when your business is ready, you've just begun making profits. And then sudden, something just happened in the business world. And you realize all the money that you had made over a period of time has been taken away from you. And you begin now, you begin again feeling like you have, you, you have lost all the years that you have made. 
Advara is being duped by fraudsters. Today we've got men and women who had money. And somehow somebody somewhere made a fraud and that money was taken away from them. I gave an example in the morning. There are even some brethren in the church who will follow certain uh, instructions on, tele on, on the phone. You find somebody telling you, you know, you have won this and the police just bonyesha number flani. And the little money that you have disappears like that. I had a sister in the church who had taken a loan. I mean, she had gone to the bank and taken a loan of 50,000 shillings. And along the way, somebody who had noted that she was doing that followed her. Okay? And the fellow went and told her, I can multiply your money. He did some tricks here and there, and she ended up giving that 50,000 to that fellow. And in a, sudden, in a minute of time, the man disappeared. And all the money she had disappeared. Fraudsters. A devourer. That's a type of a devourer. A devourer can be a loss of jobs. You've just gotten your job. You've been working over the year. Probably two or three years, you've just gotten a mortgage because your job is paying you well. Maybe you've taken a, a, an investment somewhere, and suddenly somebody comes and tells you, we have laid you off. That's a devourer. A devourer can be, I can give an example, accidents that some of us go through. You know, you've been healthy enough, you've just left your house, you're on the way, walking outside there, and suddenly somewhere a car veers off the road and you find him hitting your car or probably hitting you and you find yourself in the hospital or in some losses which you didn't even imagine you can have. This is what Paul, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean God was addressing to the children of Israel. In Malachi chapter 3 verse 11, he said, I will rebuke the devourer for your sake. And I want to pray this morning, if there is any devourer who is looking for you, may the Lord rebuke the devourer for your sake. That is my prayer for you this morning. He says, I will rebuke the devourer for your sake. The devourer manifests himself in those ways that I've, I've, I've actually mentioned to you here. Now, favor, not here, favor is when the Lord, and I repeat again, favor is when the Lord rebukes the devourer for your sake. I repeat again, favor is when the Lord rebukes the devourer for your sake. Let me explain. You know, this scripture, I had read it many times. By the way, next year, I'll be 50 years since I got born again. Next year. I got saved on 21st of July, 1975. I remember the day. In secondary school form one, 1975. In the Christian Union. The preacher was Barack Onyango. On Monday. All right? So next year, I'll be celebrating 50 years. And believe me, for the 50 years, I have read this scripture, but I never saw it in the way I want to explain to you for the next few minutes. I would always say, the Lord will rebuke the devourer. And I'm sure that's how you, what you've been saying. But I never realized there was something which God added there. And I want to bring it in, in terms of what we've been learning on favor. He says, I will rebuke the devourer for your sake. That's the word I want you to pick from here today. I will rebuke the devourer for your sake. And you will discover in the Bible, the word for your sake or in his sake, for his sake, is rarely written, used in the Bible. The only place where the word for your sake is used is in the book of Psalms 31. I mean, no, no, Psalms 23. You remember? The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie in green pastures. Help me here. It, takes, it does what? Leads me through. Still waters. Then he says, for his name's sake. Not for your sake, for his name's sake. To signify to me, God does all those things so that his name can be glorified. But for the first time, the Bible tells me here, God said, I will rebuke the devourer for your sake. I sought to find out what does the word for your sake mean. And you are free at your own time. Go to the dictionary or even go to Google and find out what that, that word means for your sake. I discovered the word for your sake means this. And listen to this. It simply means out of regard or respect for someone or oneself. Out of regard or respect for someone or oneself. Meaning... God will do that because he regards you and respects you. He will not rebuke the devourer because he just wants to. No, no, no. The Lord will rebuke the devourer because he regards you and because he respects you. And that meaning continues to say, 
If you continue reading, it says, for the benefit, advantage, or good of oneself or another person. It means that when I say for your sake, it means I have a very high regard concerning you, and I respect you so much that this thing I'm doing it because of the regard and the respect that I have for you. Now, that's what he was telling Israel. I would say he was telling Jacob. He was telling Jacob, I regard you so much. I respect you so much that when you do this, I will rebuke the devourer for your sake. Now, what was it that God was telling Israel here? I said in the first service, I mean the other services, Israel, that is Jacob, had told God, if you take me to the land where you are taking me, and you bring me back to my father's place, he said, I'm making a vow to you. It is that vow which he made to God that attracted the blessings of God in the life of Jacob. Believe me. Because, listen, when you make a vow, you are telling God, listen, these are my terms. You are telling God, listen, if you do this for me, I will do this for you. And because God is not a debtor, he loves you, he's not a debtor. God is not a debtor of any man. God will always make sure he keeps his promise. He will fulfill his part. Now, I tell God, God, if you bless me with a car, I'll carry every member of GCI when they're leaving church. You know what God will do? He will make sure he gives me a car so that I can now carry you to fulfill my part of, my part of the promise. So when this man Jacob made that promise, a vow, the Lord blessed him. He blessed him in the land that he had gone in that land. And the Bible tells me now he's leaving that land when the man is carrying a lot of blessing. A lot of blessing. To signify to me in our lives, let me come back to us, in our lives, God will always favor us with things that he has given to us. But he doesn't favor us with those things to glorify us. Whatever God gives you is to glorify him that is in heaven. And I'll show you in the Bible, in scripture. I'll show you in scripture. So he blessed Jacob to an extent whereby when he gave Jacob that blessing, there was no way he was going to take away, allow anybody to take away the blessing that he himself had given to Jacob. To signify to me, when God gives me something, he will never take away what he has given to me. He will never allow what he has given to me to be taken by another. Now, let's cascade it. The best person who can explain uh, and help us to understand how God rebukes the devourer for your sake, as I've said here, is this man called Jacob. And I'm going to give you three things that Jacob did when he left the land of Laban, to the land that God was giving him, that provoked God to, tell, to, to speak this word to Israel in the book of Malachi. Because the last time we ended, we realized through that oath, I mean, uh, 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 that vow which Jacob had made, he established what we call as the, the law of tithing. The law of tithing. It was not done by Moses during the time of the law. That law was established when Jacob made a promise and he said, to, for everything that you give me, and let me repeat here, everything that you give me, I will take a tenth of it and I will give it to you. That he was telling God, when you bless me, I will in return give back to you. To signify that I will acknowledge that you are the person who has given this to me. So the man is now leaving the land of the, the Laban and is going to the promised land. And this man has, has actually been blessed by God. Seriously blessed by God. Three things that this man did. Three things, and I want us to go very quickly for the next 15 minutes. Three things. Number one, if you can come with me. Number one, Jacob realized the weapon, the only weapon that God, can, I mean, that God uses for us to be able to rebuke the devourer was the fulfillment of that vow that he had made. I'll repeat again here. The weapon that God uses, used to make sure that this man, Laban, whom actually Jacob had taken his wealth from, to make sure that nobody touches the wealth of Jacob was the fulfillment of the vow that Jacob had made to him. Because remember, he told Jacob, now that I have blessed you, we read that scripture. He said, arise and go back to Bethel, the place where you made the vow. Meaning you made a vow to me, I have blessed you, now arise and go back to that place where you made the vow to fulfill that vow which I gave to you. I came to discover the weapon that God uses, and this one you, I pray you should write down, the weapon, the spiritual weapon 
that God uses to, 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 to rebuke the devourer is nothing but tithing. I know when I mentioned this one, Malachi 3.10 comes into. And now very few amens here now. Can I say again? The weapon that God uses to destroy the, to, to destroy the devourer is what? It's tithing. That's the weapon that God uses. So he told his Israel, if you got the book of Malachi chapter 3, and verse 10 now, we are going to verse 10. Look at verse 10. He told Israel, bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. Then the Lord said, and prove me. Again, another scripture in the Bible, which only God gives to man to test him. There is no place in scripture where God allows you to test him. No space in scripture. Even Jesus, when he went up, when the devil took him up, and he tried to tempt him, the Bible says, Jesus says, thou shalt not tempt the Lord your God. To signify to me, man has nothing that he can actually tempt God with, or test God with. But when it comes to this, the tithe, the vow that Jacob made, the Bible says, prove me, tempt me, or test me, and see with it, if I, the Lord of hosts, will not open the windows of heaven and pour a blessing upon you that there will be no more there will be no room enough to contain it he was telling jacob listen when you test me in this business you will actually be asking me to open the floodgates of heaven and what will happen the blessings of god will pour up upon you and you will not have room enough to contain the blessings which i am giving to you and i can tell you for sure this man jacob was so blessed very very much blessed so tithing Becomes now the key, the key which God uses. Because from there, you will see in verse 11, he's talking, telling us, he's commanding us, bring your tithe. He's saying, he's commanding us, honor your vow. He's saying, by doing that, I'm giving you blessings. I'm opening the doors for you. I kept telling people, tithing is like a, a, a door that is actually in heaven, where Jacob was looking and he was seeing angels. There's a door in heaven. So the moment you give your tithe, an angel opens that door, and the blessings of God begin to flow. That's what tithing does. But as God gives you those tithe, the blessings, he will never allow the devourer to take away those blessings. He will never. So verse 11 now says, look at verse 11. He says, and I will. It's God making a promise. He says, I will rebuke the devourer. For who? For your sake. Meaning, because I respect you, and I have high regard for you, I will therefore do it for you. I will do it for you. To signify to me, God will never allow what he has given to me to be taken away by a devourer. Even when you are going through the challenges that you are faced with in life. I said in the first service, sometimes when we preach these sermons, somebody will give a tithe today. After giving his tithe, he'll come to me after next Sunday and tell me, Pastor Mlema, I gave a tithe last Sunday, but I have had... A problem. I've, I've had an accident. Oh, see, this and this is happening. Why is God unfair? And I said, listen, God does not work like a, a microwave. It doesn't work like that. Even when you look at Jacob, Jacob made a vow. And it took Jacob, you know how many years? It took Jacob 20 years to serve, to serve who? To serve Laban. And by the way, those 20 years, 14 years, this man served Laban without a pay. For 14 years. It took only the last six years for God to reverse everything that this man had lost in the hands of Laban and give it back to Jacob. To signify to me, sometimes God wants you to be patient. It might not work like a computer today, but I can assure you, if you are patient and if you trust in God and if you believe in God, God will always rebuke the devourer on your behalf. If you believe it, say amen. Let me move on. So there were three things that Jacob had to do for God to rebuke the devourer in the life of Jacob. Number one, if you can check, if you can write down. Number one, Jacob, after he left the land of Laban, acknowledged, and you will see me repeating this word acknowledge every time when I stand here to, make, to, need to speak. This man acknowledged. Can somebody say acknowledged? I don't know what the word acknowledge means in Kiswahili. If I would, I would have been very happy to say, Ali, Ali Fanya Nini, Ali Tambua, 
acknowledge. This man acknowledged God as the giver of all things. God as the giver of all things. Now, I want you to remember, he's now living in Laban when he's loaded. He has got wives, two wives. He has got sons, a number of them. Many, many sons, by the way, 11 of them. By the way, almost 12 sons. He has 12 sons. He has got daughters. He has got grandchildren, I believe. This man has camels. This man has, has, has uh, horses. In our day, he has chariots. He has cars. And the man is leaving his brother's place. I mean, his uncle's place is going home. The first thing which this man acknowledged when he, God spoke to him, the man acknowledged everything that he had belonged to God. And I can tell you, that acknowledgement alone, it brought respect of him to God. And you will see this in the book of uh, Genesis chapter 31, verse 4 to verse 9, if we can go there very quickly. I have said in my notes here, within a span of less than six years, within the 20 years that this man served Laban, God had literally transferred the wealth that was Laban's into the hands of this man, Jacob. Within four years, he had all the wealth that was his father-in-law's. And in the book of Genesis 31, verse 4 to verse 6, this is what the Bible says. It says, and Jacob sent and called Rachel and Leah to the field and to his flock. This is now the 20th year. He has now acquired all the wealth. So what does he do? He calls his wife. Two wives. From the house, they go to the field where the animals are. And I said in the first service, don't do that. Don't, don't try this experiment on your wife. Don't try that experiment. It's a, it's, it's a, very, a very expensive experiment. Because he's going to be accusing his father-in-law. Okay? So he calls the wife unto his flock, and then verse 5 says, and then he said to them, and please read with me what he said to them. He said, I see your father's countenance that it is not towards me as it was before. In other words, your father's attitude towards me has changed. He says, but, help me here, the God of my father has been with me. Because this man now is very rich. He has taken away everything that belongs to the father-in-law. And he's telling the daughters of the father-in-law, the way your father looks at me is not the way he used to look at me before. Go try to tell your mother, like, your wife like that. Then he says, but God, acknowledging God, but God has been with me. Go to verse 6, quickly, verse 6. And you know that with all my power, I have served your father. I have served your father. To signify that 20 years, this man was serving Laban, Laban never, Laban never paid him. Those four years were years of, you know, years of toil. Years of whatever. But God remembered him. The last five years, six years, God remembered him. Then he says here, verse 6, you know that with all my power I have served your father. Verse 7, please quickly, verse 7. And your father has deceived me and changed my wages ten times. But, but God suffered him not to hurt me. Again, he's acknowledging God there. It means, friends, even when you are going through a hard time at your place of work, acknowledge God. Amen. Your boss may not give you a reward today. Today you may serve that company for 20 years, I mean, I mean for about five years, and nothing is happening. But when you acknowledge God, hear me, when you acknowledge it is God who has given you that place. I tell you, when the time will come for things to change in your life, you will be shocked. Amen. You will be shocked. I, 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 it reminds me, I, served, I worked for Kenya Revenue Authority, those who don't know, for, for 18 years. When I came from university, the first place I went to was to employed by customs. You know, that time it was our department in the Ministry of Finance, 1975, 1985. And I went to training in Mombasa, and after Mombasa, we were deployed. And for 18 years, I served Kenya Revenue Authority. The first 10 years, believe me, this is a fact, and it's, some, of you know, some of us here know that. The first 10 years, I was never promoted. The first 10 years. In fact, they were sending me, they were putting me in a place where, yeah, what you call as the, the dry place. Dry is where you don't see people, and you don't see money, and you don't see goods. But the fellows who were, who were in wet places were those who were doing some things. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah, they, you're called and the boss tells you, I'm sending you to the airport, or I'm sending you to this place, and make sure that every Friday you pass here with a, an envelope. But me for 10 years, I was just in the office, 10 years. Serving faithfully. Anyway, I don't have time. Towards the end of 10 years, the Lord remembered me. That time, my colleagues, were, some, of them were assist, some of them were senior collectors, others were principal collectors. I'm still a collector. 
and I'm a pastor. I've already begun GCI. All right? Some of them come to church on Sunday. They come and listen to me. But in the office, I am a collector. But when the time came, and I want you to hear this right. You know, I did what we call as hope, step, and jump. Hope, step, and jump. I moved from a mere collector. Straight, I left. I could not go into the senior collector's place. I went to the principal collector. And within a year, I was an assistant commissioner. Another one year, I was heading towards being a... Okay, let, let's, I resigned. But you know, within those five years, the last eight years, the last eight years, I had been blessed so much. I even put up a church here. I'm not saying I used customs money to put up a church, no. And some of you will begin saying, hey, he, he, no, no, no. The Lord had so much, done so much, the way he had done to Jacob. So Jacob is calling his, his wives and he's saying, listen, your father did not even pay me, but God rewarded him. Let's move on to verse 7. Is it verse 7 or verse 8? We went verse what? We went verse what? 8. Eh? Which verse were we? Somebody just... 7. Now verse 8 says, And he said, Thus the speckled shall be... This is what they had agreed with the father. But the father-in-law would change that thing. He would change that thing. But if you go to verse 9, look at what he says in verse 9. Verse 9 he says, and please read with me verse 9. He says, Thus, what did God do? He has taken away the cattle of your father and given them to me. He's telling Leah and Rachel. To me to signify, this man acknowledged that everything he had was not because of his power. Because that's the challenge that we have here. Is that when God blesses you, you begin to think it is what? It is me. That's the problem of many, in the majority of us. Okay? The other day you had nothing, but now you have something. But the moment you get that small thing, you begin to imagine, it is my power. It is my efforts. Now, this man acknowledges God is the one, he's telling his wives, God is the one who has taken away the cattle of your father, and he has given it to me. I believe when God looked from heaven and he saw how blessed this man is, all the things he had, which had been transferred from Laban, the heart of God had respect for this man. I'm talking about rebuking the devourer for your sake. Number two, the second thing. The second thing is here, Jacob was aware that there was a devourer. Just the fact that he understood there is a devourer. The Apostle Paul tells us in some scripture, he says, we are not ignorant of the devil's devices. You as a believer, you must understand that you have enemies around you. Believe me, you may have it today, Tomorrow you may not have it. Not because of any reason, but because they are enemies. Today you are, you are healthy, tomorrow you may not be healthy. There are enemies, there are devourers around you. So this man acknowledged, he realized that he was not only operating under the blessings of God, but there were people around him that were devouring what God had given to him. And this man was nobody but Laban. Laban and his sons. To the point that he turned to his, after talking this thing to his wife, his wives also realized that there were devourers who were actually around them. And you will discover this scripture in the book of Genesis 31, verse 14 to verse 15. Let's read that one together. 31, 14 to 15. I do my last point and I'll be done. Now, after he, had, he, he has spoken those things, he has told Rachel about his father. The Bible says, and Rachel and Leah. This is now the daughters-in-law. Rachel and Leah answered and said to him, can we read together? He says, is there yet any portion or inheritance for us in our father's house? In other words, now they are seeing, Akuna kitu in my baki kwenye baba yake. Then verse 15, they says, are we not counted of him strangers? For he has sold us and he has done what? He has quite devoured also our money. I think I need a wife like that one who will understand things the way I'm looking at them. You know? He's, now, the, the girls are now calling their father who? A devourer. Because they understood him. They knew him. Believe me, for the 14 years this man worked, the father was taking the money. And even for the 7 years, the 6 years, he beca they would have this agreement, he would change that agreement. They would have this agreement, he would change that. But he did not know it was working at the advantage of Jacob. So even here, his daughters realized 
This man was a devourer. To let you understand, there is a devil outside there. You as a believer, understand that the devil, the devourer, is looking for anything in your life that he can take away from you. And unless you allow God to protect you, you allow the presence of God to be around you, believe me, the things you are holding today may not stand what tomorrow is holding for you. You remember the story of Job? Now Job, God is looking from, uh, from heaven and he's saying, look at my servant Job, how favored I have given to him. How does the devil answer? He tells God, have you, do you think Job loves you for nothing? Now, you must be aware, what you have is not for nothing. The Bible tells me, he looked and he told God, haven't you surrounded him, build a hedge around him? To signify to me, the things God has given to you, there is a hedge around them. There is a protective wall around them. And what the devil is looking for is, how can I break through this wall and take what this man has? God told the devil, Satan, you go down, I'm lifting my hand. To tell you, the moment God lifts his hand over what you have, the devourer comes in. I'm lifting up my hand. He lifted up his hand over Job, and the devil came in. And you can see the things I've mentioned here. Sickness came in. You can see death came in. Destruction came in. And all the things which Job had within a space of time, Job didn't have all these things which he had because the devourer had entered and he had taken everything. As a child of God, do not be ignorant of the devil's devices. It means, brother or sister, you must be conscious there is a devil outside there. You must be conscious there is a devourer outside there. And you need the protection of God around what you have. So Jacob acknowledged that. Number three, and the last one, and this is the last one. Jacob obeyed what God had commanded him to do. And this brings me to Malachi chapter 3 and verse 10. He simply obeyed what God had told him. God had told him, arise and go. Go to Bethel, the place you made a vow. Go and honor your vow. Just this man simply obeyed what God had told him to do. And you can see this in chapter 31, verse 16 to verse 17. Genesis 31, 16 to 17, which says this. 16 to 17, if you can turn there quickly. For all the riches, again, he's acknowledging here. All the riches which God has taken from you, your father, our father. That is Laban. That is ours. This is now the, the, the girls talking, the two girls talking. And they're saying, and our children's. Now they're telling Jacob, now then, whatsoever. Can you read that with me? I want you to read that, the last one. What? Whatsoever what? Whatsoever God has said unto thee, do. What, the, what, 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 what they're saying? They were saying, whatever God has told you to do, go and do it. Because God had told them, arise and go. And fulfill your vow. And the women agreed with him. They said, listen, all this that you have, which God has given you, from our father, it is for us and our children. May the Lord make those things he has given you for you and your children. Alright? And may he not allow the devourer to take any of those things. Amen. Then they told Jacob, you go and do what the Lord has told you to do. And believe me, through the obedience of Jacob, and please get this right, the obedience of Jacob, Jacob collected, if you look at verse six, 17, look at verse 17. 17 says, then Jacob arose and set his sons and his wives upon camels. Verse 18, please. 18, and he carried away all his cattle and his goods which he had gotten and the cattle of his getting which he had gotten in Paradim to go to Isaac, his father, in the land of Canaan. So the man obeyed what God had told him to do and the man began on a journey. Now, in conclusion, do you think God was going to allow him on the way to honor his pledge or his vow for the devourer to take away what he had? And the answer is simply No. There was no way God would allow that. And I want to assure you there is no way God will allow what he has given you through favor to be taken away by another person. What God will do for the sake of the respect that you've given to him. Those three facts made God to respect this man. Number one, he has acknowledged me as the giver. Number two, he knows there is a devourer outside there. And number three, he has obeyed me. For that purpose, I will make sure I rebuke anybody who comes in his way to take what I have given to him. And that's exactly what God did. Look at this scripture. Chapter 31 and verse 24. And we'll be done. 31, 24. Genesis 31, 24. It says, and God came to Laban at night. Because as soon as the man began the journey, and he was now going, Laban appears, lands, he gets a message. The man has actually left. Laban brings his armies together. 
his workers and his uh, sons, and they begin pursuing J Jacob. In fact, the Bible tells me he went ahead of Jacob and even overtook Jacob. I'm imagining an enemy has gone before you. And then Laban is now charging towards, coming towards Jacob to take away his wives, take away his goods, and also there was a small thing which Rachel had taken from Jacob, a small god, and claim his god. Okay? Now what, did the Bible, what, what does the Bible say? God came to Laban, the Syrian, in a dream by night. And what did God do? He said to him, take heed that thou speak not to Jacob either good or bad. You know, when we leave it at this, someone will say, God was very gentle to Laban. Maybe God went to Laban and told him at night, you know, Laban, I love you very much. That boy who has gone, please, Laban, just allow him to go. God wasn't gentle to Laban. Actually, God rebuked Laban. And I know it because it is in the Bible. I know it because when you hear the testimony of Laban himself, in chapter 31 and verse 29, 30, 31 and verse 29, Laban gives a testimony. He says, is it not in the power of my hand to do you hurt? In other words, is it not in my power to harm you? He says, but the God of your father, can someone say amen there? Amen. The God of your father spoke unto me yesterday, saying, take thou heed that thou speak not to Jacob, either good or either bad. I'm seeing the Lord appearing to Laban by night and scaring Laban, telling him, listen, when you go there, make sure you don't say anything. And if you say anything, you are done. And then listen to the testimony of Jacob himself. And this is the last scripture that I'm reading here. Chapter 31 and verse 42. This is Laban speaking. Telling Jacob here, what we've read, we've read here is Laban speaking. But listen to Jacob himself now speaking in, in verse, chapter 31 verse 42. He says, except the God of my father, the God of Abraham, the fear of Isaac, had been with me, surely you, Laban, you would have sent me away now empty. He's telling his father-in-law. Then he says, God has seen my affliction. Now listen, he has seen your affliction. And he says, and the labor of my hands. And he says, and did what? Rebuked you yesterday. To link me back to the verse in Balakai. I will rebuke the devourer for your sake. Believe me, if it was not God who appeared to Laban at night, and I can say this humbly to you. If it is not God who will appear before you or before your enemy and rebuke that enemy on your behalf, you would do nothing. God had to go to Laban and tell him and rebuke him according to the words of Jacob here. And shut his mouth and, 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 and dismember him and make him useless like we normally need speak in our prayers. So that this man Jacob could preserve what he had. And it is this which he preserved that took him back to Bethel to give to God. Now listen to me. Listen to me. Tithing is the only tool, spiritual weapon, that God uses to rebuke the devourer. And I'm speaking this without any apology. Because in this church, I have never harassed anybody. I think I have never manipulated you. I have never used any kind of gimmick to extract anything from you. But the truth that we speak is that when God blesses you and he gives you what you have in your hands, acknowledge him. Acknowledge him. By acknowledging God, he puts respect on you. That's the word. He will always regard you. And he will know you have realized it is not your power. It is not your might. It is not your understanding that has brought you where you are. You will simply be telling God all I have is yours. And when God realizes, even as you have worked, you have acknowledged him as the one who's given you what you have, he will always turn in the way of the devourer to rebuke the devourer on your behalf. Amen. I hope you've learned something. I will stop at that. Thank you for listening to me. Please rise up on your feet and let's make a prayer. Father, we are grateful. We are grateful, Jesus, Thank you, Lord Jesus. It is you, God, that gives us what we have. None of us has anything that, is, that belongs to us. It is your favor. The Lord gives us the blessings that we have. Your favor. 
It is your favor. None of us has anything that we can do on our own. I pray this morning that, Lord, you will open our eyes to know what we have, like you, get, you did to Jacob, was given to him not because of what he had in his strength. It was given to him by the favor that you gave him. Open our eyes to know the health we have, the jobs we have, the businesses we have, the investments that we have made, the blessings that we have acquired in our lives do not come out of our power. They come out of your love towards us. And so, Father, I pray that, Lord, you will open our eyes to know how we can acknowledge you, how we can know it is you that gives us the abilities that we have in our lives. The Lord, without you, we can do nothing. Thank you, Lord, for teaching us that you rebuke our devourer on our behalf. You do so in our health. You do so in our businesses. Lord, you do so in our families. You do so in our places of work. You also do the same in our ministries. When the devil was attacking us, Lord, you came and you stood on our behalf and you rebuked him. May that be our portion this, after, this morning, Lord Jesus. Teach us how we can attract favor from you. How further we can attract trust from you. How, Lord, we can know that you honor us and respect us as we obey your word. Thank you for your word. And thank you for your blessing. Into your hands, I commit your people. Thank you for this service. In Jesus' name, I pray and I believe. And we all say, Amen.